Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought a man to him who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hands on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh he said to him, Ephaphtha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the dumb speak. What's going on, Fellowship? How are we doing? Hey, a lot of you guys have been asking the question, how have you been able to, to see your students? And one, how have you been doing not being able to see them? Well, the cool thing is, is the last few months we've been able to open up things to smaller groups. Uh, and so what I've been able to do since community is such an integral part of our church, and since it's the most important thing we do in student ministry, we've been able to see our kids in little spurts here and there. And, and, and there are some kids that because of the comfortability level, Level, we haven't been able to see them, but for the most part, uh, I've been able to see about 50 to 60 percent of our student ministry, which has been awesome. Uh, and, and at one of these small group hangouts, we were swimming, and one of my 10th grade girls tells me, she says, Ben, I, I really wish I knew you in high school. Uh, I really feel like we would have been friends, that we would have gotten along. And I started laughing. I said, that, that made me feel good because usually a 10th grader, I see them in public or I'll see them with their friends at a game and they act like they don't know me. And that's a real confidence boost. That's a, definitely something that makes my ego drop big time. And so when someone says that they wish they knew me in high school because they thought we'd be friends, it, it makes me feel good. And she asked me, hey, Ben, what kind of person were you in high school? And, and I got to tell you, you know, there are things that I was proud of, and there are most things that I was not proud of. Uh, but one of the things that, I, that I'm most proud of is the people that I surrounded myself with in high school. Uh, you know, in, in high school, most of the time, schools have different cliques. There's the jocks, there's the people that are in arts, there's the people who are really smart, there's the people who like the draw. I mean, there's so many different cliques of people, and when you watch different television shows and movies, they tell you that those people, they don't hang out and they don't get along. Well, we didn't necessarily hang out all the time, but we had a genuine love in our school for all of the people. There wasn't divide, there wasn't drama, and, and I have that, that, that's due to the amount of goodness that were in these people. And to give you an example of it, uh, we were on the soccer team. The, the school had just started, and we were part of that, that jock clique. And there's this new kid to come to school, and, and I can't use names, so we're going to call him New Kid. And this new kid, he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily normal. Uh, we found out that he had a very high Asperger's. Uh, we found out that he couldn't really communicate socially, uh, and so he got picked on a little bit. And there was this new kid, other new kid, we'll call him other new kid that was on the soccer team. And we show up to soccer practice one day and we ask where this other new kid is. And he says, well, other new kid was bullying new kid. And I remember there's a kid on our team, again, I can't use names, we'll call him middle linebacker because he played college football as a middle linebacker. 
he found that out and he got incredibly upset. And we were really glad that other new kid wasn't at practice because we thought there would have for sure been a fight. We show up to school the next day. Uh, a lot of the soccer team were talking about practice coming up that day, about things that we're going to do. And there in front of us, we see other new kid with new kid. And right when we see him, he knocks the books out of new kid's hands. And him and his friends think that it's hilarious. Well, middle linebacker is in this pack. And we all as a team follow his lead as he pushes other new kid into the locker, tells him uh, that he's number one, tell him that uh, he's going to be best friends with him. He never said any of that. He actually said some very nasty things. And he said, if you mess with this kid again, you're going to have to mess with me. And at this point, almost the entire soccer team was behind him. And he said, and you're going to have to mess with these people. He said, now pick up his books, give it back to him and apologize. And so he picked him up. He's terrified, gives the books back. He apologizes and he puts his arm, middle linebacker puts his arm around new kid. And he says, he's a part of us. And I'm telling you, from that moment, every time we ate, he sat with us. Every extracurricular activity that we did, whether it was going to games or whether it was going to practice or whether it was having parties or get-togethers, this kid was now a part of our clique. This kid was now a part of the athletes, and he did not have an athletic bone in his body. Trust us, we tried. We tried to have him kick a soccer ball. We tried to have him run. We tried to teach him how to shoot a basketball. He was left-handed, and, and he just didn't have an athletic bone in his body, but it didn't matter That kid was a part of us. He was an outsider that did nothing to deserve being a part of our group, but because of love now was. And I start with that story not because I want to pat myself on the back. You know, I really, really wavered and said, should I even tell this example? But the reason that I share this is in the same way that we welcomed in this new kid, Jesus in his ministry welcomed in the outsiders. He had a heart for the outsiders. Not only did outsiders flock to him, but he flocked to the outsiders. And so the question that I have as we start is how is our church doing with that? How, which example, are, are, are we the usual high school that, that has cliques that doesn't love different people because they look different, sound different, have different opinions than us? Or are we like my soccer team that welcomes in people that don't look like us, sound like us, or agree with us? And I'm not going to give you my answer to that question right now. I'm going to save that for the end. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about Jesus's day to set up our time together. You see, back in Jesus's day, the church but that you would call it, it it was very clicky. You see that there were people, the the Jewish leaders that, that were so focused on things that they were doing for God because the theology back then was the more you had, the more money, the more power, the more health that you had, the more that you were blessed and favored by God. And so that directly correlated in, into what people did. And so if, if people did and they, they were righteous and they were following the law, then they would be given more. And then the, the people that, that were not healthy, the people that were not wealthy, the people that were not prosperous back in that time, it was because for some reason God was punishing them. And what this created is this created this hierarchy system where these Jewish leaders were at the top, but these people that weren't like the Jewish leaders were in fact like outsiders, And and you see last week, it directly goes into what Doug was talking about last week when Jesus was talking about what defiles a person. You see, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, but it's what's inside of your heart. And that's what Jesus said. And then what he did is is he then talks about the Gentiles. And, And the Gentiles were considered outsiders, not because of what they did, but because they didn't have the blood that the Jews had. You see, Jews view Gentiles, non-Jewish people, as people that were dirty, as people that were unclean. And if you even came in contact with a Gentile, you were considered ceremonially unclean. And so Jesus talks about what defiles a person. And then what he does is he says, let me prove to you that what you touch and what you eat doesn't defile you. I'm going to go to a region called Tyre and Sidon. And you see, Tyre and Sidon was predominantly a Gentile country where most Jews would not even step foot. And here's Jesus going to Tyre and Sidon, and we see he meets two Gentiles. 
The first one he meets is a Gentile woman. Uh, you see uh, in, mo- in some versions, it's, she's called a Syrophoenician. In some versions, she's called a Canaanite. In some versions, she's called a Gentile. What we need to know here is that basically this woman is not a Jew. She does not have the clean blood. Therefore, she is considered unclean. And the second person that we're not going to have as much time to talk about or really any time to talk about is a Gentile who was deaf uh, and and mute. And so the first person that we talk about, that we see here is this Gentile woman, this Syrophoenician Canaanite woman that comes and she is begging Jesus. It says in in the version of uh, the story in Matthew that she kept coming to Jesus and she was pestering the disciples so much that the disciples went up to Jesus and they're like, please, Jesus, for the love of God, literally send this woman away because she's driving us insane. So then Jesus looks at this woman in chapter seven and, and he looks at this woman as she's begging for her daughter that is demon possessed for Jesus to come and heal her. He says, let the children be fed first for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. When I first got this this week, I read that and I'm like, great. <laughs> Where in the world am I going to take this? But at first it seems that Jesus was trying to insult this woman. You see, because Jews didn't like Gentiles. In fact, they hated them. In the word, they would actually call Gentiles dogs, and the Greek word for dog is kuon. And, and what kuon means is it's, it's this derogatory term for an unclean, savage mutt. And so when Jews would call Gentiles kuons, it was derogatory, and it was meant to be very insulting. But when Jesus is talking to this woman, he doesn't use that Greek word. He uses the Greek word kunarion, which does mean dog, but it's not a derogatory term. In fact, it's used to affectionately describe household pets. So I have a dog. Her name is Livy. She's a German shepherd. I would call my dog a kunarion because I have affection towards this household pet. And so what Jesus is doing is he's not trying to insult her. Because if Jesus was trying to insult her, he would have said out loud, you are a kuon. If Jesus was trying to insult her, he would have used that word, but he didn't. So the purpose of this isn't to use that term to be derogatory to this woman. But what we see instead is this is Jesus testing this woman's faith. He's trying to see what kind of response am I going to get from this woman? Is it going to be a response of entitlement? Like Jesus, like, do you see how great of a person I am? Or is he going to see someone that is completely and 100% humble? And that's exactly what we see here. He calls her a dog. And immediately what she does is she goes, you're right. I am a dog, but you are God. You are loving. The dogs still get the scraps from the master's table is what it says. And so what this woman does is this woman trades self-sufficiency for total dependence. The woman, this Gentile woman who is not a Jew, who would be considered unclean by the Jews, trades self-sufficiency for total dependence. You see in Mark chapter two, we've already talked about this a few months ago. It shows the purpose of why Jesus came. It says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He says, people that are sick, they need a physician. People that aren't sick, they don't need a physician. So Jesus says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so let me tell you what Jesus isn't saying in this passage. Jesus isn't saying that there are some people that need to be saved because they're sinners, but then there are some people who don't need to be saved because they're righteous because of what they do. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, in order for me to save you, because yes, I did come to save People first must realize that they are sick and that they are in need of saving. That's what Jesus says, but what our culture tells us, what the culture was telling these Jews back in Jesus' day and telling the culture back in Jesus' day is that Jesus isn't the cure to our problems, but we believe that self-reliance and self-sufficiency is. We don't think we need a physician because we don't see ourselves as sick. And what Jesus is, is that Jesus comes and he comes to heal the sick and Jesus becomes a threat to our very way of life. A life where we believe that we are healthy and that we can do it on our own. A life where if we were in that woman's shoes and Jesus would have called us a dog, we'd get all defensive and say, you don't know who I am. 
because we think that we are good enough. We think that we aren't sick. We don't think that we are in need of saving. And it doesn't just threaten culture. It threatens the culture that the church is throwing out too. We see sermons and we see things posted on social media from churches that say things like, there's a Goliath in your life because there's a David inside of you. We see things like, God will never give you more than you can handle. And just to say something, that's not what this teaches. At the end of the day, God will give us more than we can handle. And, and there's not, it's not because he's mean. It's not because he's some sadistic jerk that's just trying to see us in pain. The purpose is so that we can stop looking at ourselves so we can lo- stop looking at our own strength and we would turn and look up and look at God and his strength, the only person that can get us through this. You see, we are in need of help because we are sick. We can't do it on our own. And we only realize this, and this is what the Gentile woman did so well, is that she traded that self-sufficiency for total dependence. God, I can't do it. Jesus, I can't do it. But she says, yes, Lord. She says, you are Lord. You are in control. You can. She came to Jesus understanding that the only way her daughter was going to be healed was that Jesus healed her. She was totally 100% dependent on him and entitled to nothing. She proclaims the truth in who Jesus is, but she also proclaims the truth in what she is not. She realizes that she is not good enough. She realizes that she is sick and that she needs Jesus. And so that's the woman's stance. And that's the stance that the Jews were supposed to have. This surrender to God saying, I can't do it on my own. The purpose of the law was to show the Jews and to show us that we can't do it on our own. But instead what we did is that we turned the law back to ourselves and say, well, I guess I can keep that. And that wasn't the purpose of it. The purpose of it was to show us that we are in need of saving, that we cannot do it. And then here's the Pharisees who believe that their righteousness and what they do for God makes them something special. They don't see themselves as sick. They see themselves as healthy. But what the Pharisees didn't realize is during Jesus's time, is they didn't realize that they were just as sick and they were just as much of an outsider as these outsiders that Jesus was welcoming in. But they couldn't see that because they had such a high opinion. They had so much pride in who they were. And so this woman, she trades self-sufficiency for total dependence, giving us the idea, giving us the example that we are supposed to take in coming to Jesus, understanding that the only reason that we are not an outsider anymore, it has nothing to do with us, and it has everything to do with the grace and love and mercy of Jesus. We did nothing to be an outsider, but so many times we can make ourselves like these Pharisees that feel like we're entitled because of what we do, thinking that we got ourselves out of the outsider club and into the kingdom of God when really we did nothing to deserve that. So she traded self-sufficiency for total dependence, something that the Pharisees miss and something that I miss and we miss every single day of our lives. And the second thing that we need to realize, hints on what we just talked about, is that we were outsiders that need to welcome in other outsiders. We were outsiders that now need to welcome in other outsiders. You see, Jesus comes in in his ministry and completely turns the culture over on its face. He takes what what people believe is true religion is what's going to get them favor with God. And basically he curb stomps it. And he says, this is what you think it is, but this is actually isn't true at all. He, he completely turns it over on his face. You even see that in, the, in his first sermon recorded in the book of Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount. He comes in and he says, hey, you've heard it said you shouldn't commit murder. But I say, if you have hate in your heart for your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart. 
what he's doing is he is he's getting this idea that 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 was had in that time that you are what you do and then he turns it and what Doug talked about last week what we're talking about this week is he's talking about it's not about your outside it's not about what you do but it's what is in your heart and what he's trying to show is that in this time and even in our time today there's really two really important things that the Jewish leaders and we have missed. The first thing back in Jesus's day that these Jewish leaders missed is they were so busy doing for God that they missed God standing right in front of them. I I think about this. These Pharisees were like pastors back in the day, but like obsessive pastors. They memorized the Bible. They, they fasted multiple times a week. They literally, for their whole lives, studied scripture. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, the Old Testament is all pointing to this idea that this Messiah is going to come. There's, they're reading and studying about Jesus. And they're, they're, but they miss the point. They start viewing the law as things that they do for, to make them righteous, Then here comes Jesus, the person that the law was pointing to. They see him face to face and they go, that's not, that's not really God. And then for the next three years, they try to disprove that he's God and they end up killing him. Try to, try to give a a, a real life example here. Real life example. I'm a huge Florida Gator fan. Uh, and I love Tim Tebow. Let's say I was obsessed with Tim Tebow. You know, I you know shared everything he shared on social media. I have all of his posters signed in my room. You know, I go to all of his events. I've memorized the book that he wrote. I mean, I am obsessed with Tim Tebow. Let's say Tim Tebow comes up and he goes, "What's up, guys? I'm Tim Tebow." And I look at Tim Tebow and I go, "That's not really Tim." And, and, and I'm looking at Tim Tebow, and then for the next three years of my life, I try to disprove that that is Tim Tebow, and I get so passionate that that's not Tim Tebow that I end up killing him. Like, first of all, I'd be in jail because that's a little creepy, but that's what these Pharisees did. Their whole lives, they're studying the Bible, which is pointing to Jesus, is pointing to God in human flesh coming to earth then here is God, the person that they've been studying, and he's right in front of their faces and they end up killing him, missing the point. So that's the first thing that they miss. The second thing that they miss is that they miss the point and purpose of being God's people. Again, going to the Bible, uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis really set up the story from creation and really showing the problem with sin. And then starting in verse 12, it starts with, God talking to this man named Abram and he goes, hey, what up, Abram? Hey, so cool story. You don't have any kids right now. That stinks, but you're gonna have kids one day and that kid is gonna have kids and they're gonna have kids. I'm gonna make a great nation out of you. Everyone born from you is going to become the Israelites and they're going to be my people and I am going to be their God. And there's gonna be so many of them. There's gonna be more than the stars in the heaven and the sand on the sea. Ain't that cool, Abram? And Abram's like, sweet. And what's the purpose of that? In the, in, the very, in the very first few verses of God talking to Abram, we see the purpose of it. He says in verse two, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. Why? So that you can be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And then the people said, hey God, say it louder for the people in the back. God repeats what he said in verse two. And he says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God tells Abram, I'm going to bless you, not just so I can bless you, but I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing and I look at that and what these, what these Pharisees and what these Jews of the day have done is that they've seen themselves as being blessed by God, but they hold it in for themselves. And they say, it doesn't matter. The other people are not blessed by God. And so they're going to be considered unclean and we're not going to use our blessing to bless them. And then I look at it and I look at those two things that these people missed And I ask myself, how many times have I missed that? How many times do I get so busy doing for God that I miss God? 
How often do I read my Bible and pray and do all of these really good things and then all of those things end up leading me to believe that I'm somebody special, that I'm some super Christian and then that leads me to this idea of being entitled the whole time, missing the idea that the only reason that I'm not an outsider anymore has nothing to do with what I've done or what I will do, but it has everything to do with the fact that Jesus is loving and Jesus is merciful and Jesus died for me so that I no longer have to be an outsider which then leads me to miss out on the second thing, the purpose as to why Jesus called me to not be an outsider anymore. And what I do so often and what we do as a church so often is we hold on to it to to believe that we are blessed just to be blessed, missing the idea just like the, the Jewish religious leaders did back in Jesus's day, missing the purpose that, hey, you're not just God's people to be God's people, you're God's people to be a blessing. We're called out of being an outsider so that we can welcome other outsiders in. Time and time again, I miss it, and time and time again, we miss it. You see, we read stories in the Bible that talk about these Pharisees that are missing it, and we shake our head in disapproval and disgust, thinking, how could you miss it so badly, not realizing that the people we have most in common with in the Bible are actually the Pharisees. We look at stories like David and Goliath and we tell ourselves that we're David, that we're gonna get ourselves out of our problems, but really we're the Israelites in that story that, that stayed in camp absolutely terrified, realizing that if we try to take on Goliath on our own, we are going to get destroyed. So let me get back to the question that I asked in the beginning. How are we doing at welcoming the outsiders in? How are you doing? How how is your family doing? How is your community group doing? How is the, the body of believers that you're surrounding yourself with every single day doing at welcoming in people that don't look like us, that don't sound like us, that live different lifestyles than us, and listen to this, that don't even agree with us? You know, I, I turn on the news, I, I, I watch social media, and it doesn't take long for me to get disgusted with the, with the state of the church, where it's become so polarized because of opinions. And this is what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that opinions aren't important, but what I'm asking is, is are you going to continue to love somebody even when they don't agree with you? And here's my question to you. Remember, we're all trying to be more conformed into the image of Christ. Think about Jesus when he met the woman at the well in John 4, a woman that was sleeping around, that that was now married five times and living with someone that wasn't her husband. Imagine Jesus being with Mary Magdalene, who was literally a prostitute. Like Jesus wasn't like, hey, I see you being a prostitute. That's cool. I agree with that. That's a cool lifestyle to be a part of. Oh, I guarantee you, Jesus didn't agree with the lifestyle that they were living, but what did he continue to do? Time and time again, he continued to love Because here's the deal, if Jesus would have loved the people that he 100% agreed with, then all of us would still be dead in our sin and all of us will still be destined for hell for eternity. We can still love and not agree with people. And what I'm trying to say is that opinions, yes, are important. I've got lots of them, probably too many sometimes. (laughs) But if our opinions allow us to change the way we view people, to change the way we love people, then that opinion is sitting on a throne that only Jesus was designed to sit on. That opinion has become an idol. We have to remind ourselves daily that we are nothing special, that we are not entitled to the love of God. We did nothing to deserve being called out of being an outsider and into the kingdom in the fold of God. We need to be taking the approach that the Gentile woman took in Mark chapter seven when Jesus goes, but you're just a dog. And she goes, yes, I am, but you are God. You see, when I was in high school, 
that kid, that, that, that new kid did nothing to deserve being a part of our group and being welcomed into our group. But because of love, that kid, even though he had no athletic bone in his body, was an athlete with us. In fact, that kid, uh, when he graduated from high school, got an honorary letter and an honorary letterman's jacket. He did nothing to deserve that, but what he did is that he became a part of who we are, and in the same way, Jesus does that for us. We have been outsiders welcomed in, but we're not just welcomed in just for the sake of being welcomed in. We're welcomed in so that we can be a blessing to other outsiders as we show them that they are loved and that they can be given grace as well. It's time for us former outsiders to go love some other outsiders. And what we say every single week, I feel like has so much power today. Have a great week, fellowship, and go love first. See you guys.